Welcome to the Environmental Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Grady, and our mission is to bring you interviews with leaders in the environmental industry that, and with the goal of providing you information about industry trends, climate change, future energies, circular economy, regulatory topics, and service providers making an impact in the industry. And today's guest is Bart Eads. He's a new author uh, with his new book. It's called... Um, uh, learning from tomorrow. There it is. Learning from tomorrow. Strategic using strategic foresight to prepare for the next dis big disruption. So, great book, uh, Bart. And uh, I love the I love the book. I thought it was really good. So, before we jump in, let's uh, talk a little bit about yourself and give the readers a little bit more information about you before we dive in. Some good questions about this. So, thanks, Sean. First off, let me thank you for inviting me on to the environmental transformation podcast. You've been doing some great stuff and Thank I'm you. honored to be among your distinguished group of invitees for a chat. And Absolutely. I look forward to talking about uh, strategic foresight. Yeah. So a little bit about me, maybe. Uh, I am originally from Western Canada, from Saskatchewan, okay. uh, which is not the first province people think of when they think of Canada. Uh, but I spent my formative years in the desert in Arizona. Oh, ah, okay. All right. Yeah. So a little bit of time in the U.S.? Yes, indeed. Quite a lot of time. I, I basically was raised there and did my education there. And uh, I spent much of my career uh, working in the international development space. Okay. So, uh, last, last 20 years, for example, with the Asian Development Bank. So this is, it's an intergovernmental organization. It's owned by some 67 different countries, including the U.S., but with mostly Asian and Pacific members. And it provides financing for physical and social infrastructure to promote development in what used to be a bunch of poor countries in Asia and increasingly uh, our countries that are rising up the economic ranks. Oh, I'm sure that's the, did you get to go, did you have a chance to go to Asia quite often and, and, you know, experience the, the economy and the culture over there? Absolutely. In fact, for most of those 20 years, uh, I was based in Southeast Asia. Uh, ADB is headquartered in Manila in the Philippines. Okay. And there I had a number of regional assignments that took me around the region. So I've been to uh, Pacific islands and uh, out to the Caucasus in the far Western part of Asia and most places in between, China, India, Sri Lanka, uh, Laos, Cambodia, uh, quite a number of wow, countries. You are a well-traveled man. That's pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> My daughter lives in Bali right now, and uh, she just loves that place. Uh, and she spent a little bit of time in Sri Lanka as well. So she's been around. I haven't, but uh, I know she has. Well, maybe you can plan that for a future holiday. I'm hoping. Yeah, let's we'll get past this little COVID uh, restrictions and we're going. I just had my second shot last weekend, so I, hopefully it'll be in good shape here soon. Well, tell us about your new book, uh, Strategic Foresight. You know, I mean, uh, learning from tomorrow, the use, the using strategic foresight to prepare for the next big disruption. Uh, you know, what, what are we talking about here? You know, because, you know, I think a lot of people are kind of like, curious you know what, what what's what's strategic foresight all about well maybe i'll tell you uh, i'm going to answer that question sean uh, but i'll tell you how i got into it so uh, there i am working in asia for much of my professional career and in the past two decades we've seen a dramatic shift in kind of global power and influence in just about every domain whether we're talking yeah. technology uh, the economic weight of Asia, uh, new innovations, uh, growing wealth, uh, big middle classes that are expanding by the day. And in a sense, Asia is pointing to the future. It's becoming a more and more part, uh, more and more important part of the world. And while, while I was out there, I saw that all transpiring around me uh, as once poor countries rose up into the middle income ranks. And at the same time, having been in an international organization for a long time, and before that, in other public sector organizations, one thing that continually came back to me was, you know, with change all around us and change that's accelerating with technological advancements, a lot of these organizations don't do a great job of considering what may come next. Uh, they, 
they may have an occasional forecast of oh economic uh, trends in 10 years, but they don't really look at how different uh, trends might interact and, and influence uh, different possible futures. And, and that got me thinking about a strategic foresight. So what is it exactly, your question here? In short, it's like a, a structured and systematic way of using ideas about the future to anticipate and better prepare for change. Strategic foresight, yeah. So are the ideas, are they things that you would like to see manifest dated, you know, manifest, have basically something to come to fruition that you're, you're trying to create the vision for? Is that kind of what we're talking about here? That's certainly a part of it, Sean. And um, envisioning an ideal future and where you want to go is part of the big foresight picture. Yeah. Let me explain it. Let me explain a little bit further. So uh, frequently strategic foresight is used to develop plausible alternative scenarios. To, so to look at um, how trends that are emerging and, and, and drivers of change, big movements that are interacting, how they might interact over a period of 10 years or more to create different kinds of futures for us. Uh -huh. so a strategic foresight exercise will typically come up with different scenarios, say three, four, or five. And among those might be a preferred scenario, one that you and those in your organization or in your country may want to strive for. So a visioning a preferred future is, it can definitely be part of a foresight exercise, but it can also be more neutral. What are the likely paths uh, for, for humanity, for society, for the world we live and work in? Mm -hmm. uh, but that's it, coming back to the scenarios aspect. This is a big part of strategic foresight. So what got you interested in foresight and, and that, you know, you say, I want to write a book about this stuff because <laughs> I mean, I don't know a lot of people that sit there around and think about this in this way. So this is kind of interesting. Yeah. Well, about four years ago, Sean, I was managing the, the team at ADB. So this international organization working across Asia and the Pacific, a team dealing with knowledge management. So how we were using our it's called intellectual assets, how, how we were learning from lessons and, and sharing information and analysis across uh, divisional lines and across the organization. And uh, some of my team uh, brought to me this idea, look, there's this whole movement going on with strategic foresight and, and a larger category of, of thinkers looking into the future, futurists. Mm -hmm. And they said, look, we, we should be drawing upon these tools in what we do in our organization. So we're better prepared for different possible futures. So uh, we initiated some training um, for, for staff and I moved on to other roles and eventually left the organization, but strategic foresight has gained a, a, a deeper hold within that organization, as well as other international organizations and national governments around the world. So it sounds like it's, um a methodology that is is being adopted by a lot of uh, foreign governments and other maybe larger organizations to help better prepare for you know the future in, in a way or better prepare for the design of where they want to go yes a that's a really good way of putting it you know in, in terms of its history i mean for as long as people have walked the earth uh, we've looked to the future. We've been curious about what's around the corner and what's beyond, whether it was centuries ago when I was uh, imagining if there was uh, there was land across the sea or in more recent decades, uh, looking to space. Mm -hmm. So uh, people have always been curious about what, what, what lies beyond. But the, the modern roots of strategic foresight can be traced back to the 1950s. So okay. think, think in the Cold War period. <clears throat> Uh, when the Soviet Union and the U.S., uh, these rivals uh, were staring uh, at each other, uh, armed to the hilt with nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And who comes along a fellow named Herman Kahn. Herman Kahn was a military strategist and a systems theorist. He worked for a think tank based out in California called RAND. Okay. And and he was, uh, Rand was largely financed at this point by the US government, by uh, the Defense Department. And they were, they had a conundrum. They didn't, they were confronting the possibility, uh, real possibility of a nuclear war at yeah. some point, right? 
And this is nothing that military strategists since the beginning of time, since we were throwing rocks at each other, had ever contemplated. I mean, you could have a war that would devastate the entire planet and kill off much of humanity. So there was no real precedent to how do you deal out. with that? <laughs> yeah, how do you how do you approach something like that? It's it was uh, it was you had in short, Sean, you had uncertainty to an absolutely unprecedented degree with with a potentially disastrous outcome. So what Herman did in short is he he brought to the thinking he brought um, basically some aids to our thinking to uh, by developing multiple imagined futures that could be developed through simulations like war games and and scenarios yeah i remember and, that that movie war games that was a good one <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was so, a good one <laughs> it was and so well, <laughs> herman did this all through the 1950s he was advising the u.s military and it eventually got picked up by this a little eccentric un unconventional senior figure at royal dutch shell so this yeah. massive Petroleum company, a guy named Pierre Wack got he he met Herman. He, he got he got in touch with him and and wanted to find out more about this scenarios work, which had spilled out of Rand, and he brought it into the private sector, into this big oil company in the beginning of the 1970s, right? And so what Pierre Wack and his colleagues did is they developed scenario planning um, that enabled Shell to get ahead of the game and beat their competitors in anticipating the OPEC oil embargo of 1973. They didn't say with certainty internally that this was going to happen, but they looked at the different pieces of the puzzle and, and possible ways that trends could fit in together, including the growing economic influence and, and the power of the Middle Eastern countries sitting on all this oil that, that uh, other countries needed. Yeah. And they said, look, the, uh, at some point, they could use their economic power to create an embargo, restrict the sale of this, drive up the price, and use it for political advantage. And it was because they were using scenario planning at Royal Dutch Shell that they were able to uh, basically prepare for different scenarios, including this one. Yeah, I got to imagine in their thinking, they were thinking, um, well, let's let's implement and Let's build some additional assets to insulate ourselves away from the need to rely on OPEC so that we can still produce, you know, the, the oil and still be productive. I, I got to imagine that was part of their scenario yes. planning. Yeah. And and they, of, of all the companies in the world, they remain the best known for using scenarios. And they put some of them um, on their website for people to, to explore. And they don't limit it to just the petroleum sector. I mean, I cited mm -hmm a prominent example where they were looking at oil, but there are other things in the world, political, um, war, uh, other other factors that could disrupt the environment in which you're, you're selling this product. And so they were able to also anticipate things like the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, the rise of Muslim extremism and, and other developments by the use of scenarios. Okay. All right. Well, okay. Well, so I read the book and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty fascinating uh, as I was running through the various processes that and, and steps you that you you know you go through to develop your scenarios. But one thing that kind of underlying question I had was, well, what's the difference between forecasting a situation and foresight? Because I, I was, I think most people have more uh, maybe a better understanding of what forecasting is versus foresight. So maybe you can help us that understand that. Absolutely. And it's probably unfortunate that the two terms, which have a relationship are sounds so similar, right? Foresight, forecasting, what, what is the difference? Well, in a nutshell, forecasting involves generating numbers about some variable in the future. It's, it's a sub discipline of prediction. So it makes predictions about the future on the basis of of time series data. So think of, Sean, think of the weather or stock prices, a population or merchandise sales or currency rates. Uh -huh. These are the kinds of things that are forecasted. And to come up with a forecast, you typically use historical or present day numbers and trends analysis. And, and you predict that it's going to be, you know, a, a low 
turnout or a high turnout or you know steady yeah. state right exactly <laughs> and so you can make a longer term uh forecast a few years down the line or next quarter what are our sales going to be or what is electricity demand in two quarters um now that's uh that's forecasting now foresight and i use the term foresight just for simplicity rather than saying strategic foresight all the time I'm, it's the same thing sure. foresight typically generates scenarios so not one set uh, not one predicted number in fact numbers don't tend to fit into uh, a foresight study uh, in its conclusions foresight generates scenarios a narrative a story right so and it also is not for the short term foresight is not a whole lot of use in general for what's happening next week or next quarter or next year we're looking at 10 years or beyond and in, in the case of uh, the usual use of, of foresight now now data can definitely be useful in preparing these scenarios uh, they can help identify for example key drivers of change so if we look at john big changes around us you can put numbers around a lot of them like automation or climate change uh, or you know environmental challenges how species are disappearing or uh, forest cover is being depleted you can put numbers around these things mm -hmm. but a foresight study will look further down the line and rather than pinpoint one or two numbers this is what we predict there's no prediction involved it's it's creation of alternative plausible scenarios that are very different well, how does one or a group of people develop the alternative scenarios that could play out? Because when I read the book, I thought, hmm, okay, is there a tendency to maybe overdo a, a scenario that you, you know, you'd like or you prefer, you know, like, I really would like this scenario to turn out like this. I'm going to create this alternative uh, scenario and, and it may not really be the best situation for your organization. Uh, so I'm just kind of curious, you know, what is, uh, what certain aspects of, of each of the alternative scenarios actually, you know, manifest themselves if, you know, when you put them all together, like, I guess I'm kind of rambling a little bit here with this question, but you know, how do you sit down and identify the scenarios you're really trying to achieve when you, when you start this process? Yeah, it's, it's a spot on question. And, uh, and with it, you highlight the need to approach any new foresight study with certain parameters, you know, maybe <laughs> Sorry? some parameters, maybe. Yes, exactly. Um, okay. And it's, you can't, if it's done for say uh, the purpose, somebody wants to sell a certain image or idea and, and they want to game the system. I mean, you can do that with any kind of a process, right? Not just with strategic foresight. Sure. Um, but some of the precautions against that, well, some of the ways you avoid that um, is by involving a wider um, group of, of stakeholders. Okay. Uh, so an, an example, let, let me cite a specific example of how foresight was used um, and it led to actually decision making um, that, that is changing things, right? It's not just a study that sits on a shelf that's interesting, something that might happen. And this was, this was in the European Union. And uh, last year, that's in the latter part of 2020, they adopted a new action plan on customs. So, so dealing with you know, tariffs and the sale of goods across borders. And the EU now consists of 27 different countries. So they have all these different customs systems and they got to coordinate on a common customs policy. So in 2018, they launched uh, an exercise aimed at helping policymakers um, to develop a custom system that that's going to remain relevant and, and to update it, you know, for example, to include, uh, you know, technological changes and digitalization and all that. So uh, they called this whole exercise, the future of customs in the EU in 2040. And what they did is they began with a foresight process. Okay. And that started with a, a participatory exercise involving about 40 participants from different countries uh, over the course of a year. And it include a range of stakeholders. So not just one interested group or not just the decision makers, but for example, customs authorities from different countries, uh, trade associations, uh, other international organizations, consumer groups, et cetera. So they brought these people together yeah. and without getting into the, the weeds about how they proceeded with this, they used a number of tools 
in several different workshops to, to, to look at how different drivers of change and trends in customs might interact to generate different scenarios. So they, they did that, they came up with a handful of different scenarios. And then at the end of that process, they identified a vision. And this is often connected with a foresight process. It's not just looking at how things might play out in some plausible way, but what is our vision looking into the future? How, you know, because we're not just, we're not just helpless uh, or, or powerless uh, influencers, um, we, we can change, we can change what future comes by the actions we take today. So they, they spelled out a vision, all of these different stakeholders and exposed policymakers, decision makers in the EU to this vision. And the, the European commission approved this action plan last year based on a vision that came out at the end of this foresight exercise. And this action plan spells out specific things that, the bureaucracy and decision makers are gonna do for the next five years as a first step toward this vision of a, a renewed and updated modern custom system in 2040. So when they start out, um, it sounded to me like when I read the book that there was this <clears throat> need to put a timeline parameter to the focus of the scenario. So it wasn't just an open-ended thing. Uh, process and it wasn't something that was too near term, like, you know, just a, a year or so from here, you know, it had to be a good, you know, maybe 10, 20, 30 years out as the vision and, or, you know, as the milestone. And then it sounds like you're also establishing some sort of a, like ultimate vision that you would like the process to, you know, set on or, you know, end up at throughout the end of the process. And then you're creating the very scenarios to meet and achieve the vision? Is that how this works? Well, in a way. Okay. Not every foresight exercise will have visioning involved. Okay. It's often part of the process because it, it, it gives us a way to react as we look at these different scenarios and it empowers us. That's our vision. Now, what can we do to get there? But mm -hmm. in some cases, so uh, I'm talking to you from Montreal here in Canada and uh, in the capital of Canada, Ottawa, mm -hmm. There is a, a government body they call Policy Horizons, and there are over 30 staff dedicated to doing strategic foresight. Wow. So they will, uh, on behalf of different government bodies, they will carry out studies, again, looking 10 years and beyond, and they'll produce a report and they'll come out with a number of different scenarios. But they won't always come out with these are our recommendations or this is the preferred vision. Rather, they're providing material to the decision makers. Look, based on our thorough analysis and, and explaining the steps and the experts involved and the processes followed, these are the scenarios that we think are, are quite plausible. And then it's up to decision makers to decide what to do. So it doesn't always come with a vision, but it can be quite um, okay. can be useful for that purpose. Um, yeah. So what happens if an organization decides to select an alternative scenario that they've gone through and identified and invest, you know, a lot of time and money into pursuing it? And then, you know, the potential outcome is, is wrong or something happens where it's like, it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, that seems to be like you're gambling on this, man. Your horse didn't make it, man. I don't know. Well, Tell me what you think there. <laughs> well, there are no guarantees in life. Right. Uh, and, you know, you can think of it as establishing a goal for yourself. Like you and I might decide that we're going to start exercising more or eat more, pro you know, eat better. Uh, but whether or not we stick to that, there's a number of variables, starting with maybe our, our, our discipline and, and focus and, and such. That, that's perhaps too simple an analogy. But you get the idea that um, just because you have a vision doesn't mean you're going to get there. L let me give you uh, an example from the foresight world. So I had talked a bit earlier about this guy, Pierre Wack, senior uh -huh. official at Royal Dutch Shell. And so he introduced scenarios. And in South Africa, in the beginning of the 90s, the country was on the precipice of great change. Uh, apartheid was starting to unravel and uh, something new was going to emerge. And so uh, a group of about 22 dozen people um, South Africans, politicians and activists, academics and business people from across the ideological spectrum, right? So they weren't just government officials. They weren't just the opposition. It was a mix of people. Mm -hmm. They got together 
and in a process that was financed by a couple of Western donors. And they brought in a foresight specialist who knew how to facilitate workshops, brought him in from Shell, right? He oh, came wow. from okay. South Africa and he worked with a group of people, South Africans from different backgrounds who saw dangers ahead of them. Imagine, I mean, you could have, you could have had a complete unraveling mess or civil war. God knows what could happen, right? So they right. got together and they went through this typical foresight process of developing scenarios. And it's all public, by the way. It's, it's a fascinating exercise. They call the Montfleur exercises or Montfleur scenarios, to be more specific. Montfleur scenarios. That's a town in the Western Cape where all of this took place in 1991 and 1992. Mm -hmm. So they came up with these scenarios and three of them weren't too bright. You know, they just they looked at the way things were going and the history of South Africa at that point and, and the different you know elements and, and unemployment and inequality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And three of the scenarios are not so great. One of them, in contrast, was actually pretty positive, an inclusive society, one that was moving forward. Um, and so they chose one of those four scenarios, obviously the bright one. Um, yeah, that's the outcome they wanted to achieve because they didn't want to go backwards, right? They wanted yeah. to move forwards. Yes. And so they took that scenario, which they didn't game. I mean, they worked through, they had many workshops and, and, and afterward, uh, this, this smaller group uh, went and shared their scenarios with different parts of South African society and key players, including the, the ANC. And so they, they reverse engineered, okay, this is our preferred scenario. Uh, we we're going to reverse engineer this in a way to see what are the steps, the actions, the decisions that have to take place between now and 10 years. The time frame they were using was 10 years. So figure gotcha. uh, from 1992 when this was finished to 2002. Where do we as a society, as a country, as a multiracial democracy, where do we want to be? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's actually a, a, a tool uh, they use in foresight called backcasting. So it's a planning method that starts with defining a desirable future and then working backwards. Um, so they set that up. And uh, I haven't gone through um, the, the precise uh, status of where things stood in 2002 when the 10 years came up, where South Africa was and where this visioning was going to place them. It wasn't a perfect match, but the worst case scenarios were not realized. South Africa remained intact. It remains a democracy like many others challenged by a, a variety of things. Um, so getting back to your point, did they perfectly reach their vision future? No. But uh, in this particular case, the one they chose, they were probably closer to that after 10 years than they were to the dark scenarios, which envisioned very, a very unhappy outcome of the end of uh, apartheid. Sure. Well, what are some of the prerequisites uh, you know, for using foresight? I mean, what conditions, you know, support the application of foresight in an organization? Look, it helps to have uh, an open-minded organization because frankly, what you may come up with can't be predicted at the beginning of the process. So if you're looking at, uh, say you, you're in the business of selling widgets, because you can use foresight in organiz government organizations, intergovernmental organizations, companies, non-government organizations, but if you're in business and, and, and you're selling widgets, uh, imagine that uh, a studying of these various drivers of change leads you to at least one scenario, a plausible one where widgets are no longer in demand. Whatever widgets are used for today, that's been replaced by, I don't know, 3D printing, or uh, we found other ways of, of accomplishing certain tasks without widgets. Um, that could be quite shocking to an organization, to a business that makes widgets, and that might imply uh, substantial changes uh, to their business model. So it, that that points to being able to uh, 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 being agile, being willing to to change course, and to adopt sometimes rather dramatic changes. Um, we think of uh, companies like Kodak that didn't quite get it right. Uh, no, they didn't. <laughs> didn't talk about them anymore, um, yeah. and so. Starting an environment, a, a learning organization, one that uh, is open to change. And I come back to the participatory element. You find a lot of foresight studies. Um, having a small group around the senior management working in a, in a 
back room uh, on foresight and just talking to each other, that's that's not going to necessarily produce anything um, useful, nor will it have the support of of, of, of the organization, yeah, everybody in it, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're if you're a staff member, uh, you know, low down the rank, but are valued for having insights from a certain perspective and may see things that you know a manager doesn't all the time. Um, that could be quite useful in developing alternative scenarios. And if you're part of that process that concludes that, hey, we've got to change course, you're more likely to go along with it than if you're presented with a fifth and complete and tomorrow we're firing half our people, ending uh, two thirds of our uh, lines of business and, and moving somewhere into something else. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, well, OK, so let's talk about the How would we use foresight to help us protect the environment? You know, we're the environmental transformation podcast. And so we're talking a lot about environmental challenges that we face in society as a country, and as a government. You know, what do we how could we use foresight to help us, you know, improve the environment that we live in? Because there's a lot of things going on that a lot of people there's so much environmental awareness in society right now, more so than ever before, in my opinion. And people are really kind of concerned, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and they should be concerned. It just it, it highlights again, Sean, the importance of your podcast and the messages that you're trying to share through it. Let me give you an example. I, I really like this one, and it's it's right right into um, issues of concern for those who who care uh, deeply about the environment. And this is an example of what's called horizon scanning. So this would be part of any foresight exercise, but it can also be done. On a, as a standalone exercise. It doesn't necessarily need to yield plausible alternative futures at a certain future date. Horizon scanning is something that organizations can do all the time. And in fact, I recommend it because it can help attune you to changes as they're uh, at their early stages. So the one I'm talking about is um, it takes place every year and it involves about 30 experts in futures research uh, as well as advisors to policymakers and practitioners of, of conservation and other aspects of environmental science. And so every year, uh, this, this group of experts is brought together uh, by a, a professor named Bill Sutherland, who's at Cambridge University's Department of Zoology in England. And okay. since, since 2009, what they've been doing with this horizon scan is they're looking, they're identifying 15 topics that could have major impacts on society's ability to conserve regional or global biodiversity, but for which the conservation community um, generally has low awareness. So they're trying to capture, um, you know, emerging concerns uh, that could affect biodiversity that are being skimmed over because, you know, frankly, in any organization, including environmental ones, we, we have our priorities, we're getting on with things, and we may not be looking beyond to what could come next. And so they're trying to uncover what are the emerging issues. And so every year, um, Sutherland and, and, and a group uh, of, from different aspects of the environmental uh, movement and, and environmental science gather together. And um, in this ex example from 2018, one of the years they did this, um, they ended up reaching out uh, to some 500 people. Um, they did this through targeted social media, through through meetings, back when we could actually meet face-to-face. -face, yeah. uh, the, the, these experts were contacting through their networks and they identified initially 91 issues um, that could meet the criteria of these kind of under the radar threats to conservation and biodiversity. And again, not getting into the weeds, they used um, a, a process of, of, of surveying, of discussion, some of it done, uh, say, by email, but then sitting down at a final stage when they whittled the list down to about 35, 37 issues uh, to have further discussions, um, ultimately um, yielding 15 conservation issues um, that they they rated on these criteria as, as the ones that um, really... Uh, um, should be of concern to the uh, environmental because um, they were like the emerging ones that are just under the radar, but the, people need to be aware of them. Exactly, and so you know, one might ask, "That's all great, Bart, but um, what I've never heard of this list, and where's you know, and these fifteen issues? 
Do we know what became of them? Well, in a sense we do, because in, um, in 2019, uh, Sutherland and collaborators came together and what they did is they, they looked back um, at the issues that were identified in the first edition of this conservation horizon scan. So right. look, okay, in 2009, these were the 15 issues, what, what happened to them? And so they went to 12 leading conservation organizations, British and international conservation organizations, and presented this list from 10 years ago, which again, these, these were issues that were not really getting much attention and under the radar. And what they found is that in, in 2019, the conservation organizations were more aware of each and every one of those 15 issues. They were like the there. dominant topics probably at the time now, right? 20 yeah. years later or 10 yeah. years later. Well, they were, there was certainly, um, they were getting more attention in 2019, basically around now. Yeah. Than they were just a year after the initial horizon scan, because some of these things were just beginning to emerge or showing the potential to emerge. So what these findings suggest is that this yearly conservation horizon scan has been useful for identifying emerging issues of significance. So, you know, in the environmental industry right now, you know, some of the emerging issues, if you were to you know, take a pulse of what's going on in the industry, you know, I'm, I'd say I have a pretty good idea. I'm not you know, an expert in any of them all the, all the way, but, you know, um, you know, ESG, environmental social governance is huge right now, right? And so many co companies are going out and basically, you know, staking uh, their claim to the fact that they're going to do everything they can to be zero carbon, zero net carbon by 2035. That's huge. I mean, now we're talking, okay, so, you know, greenhouse gas, monitoring, tracking is a big thing. You know, that's going to be a huge thing. Uh, you know, reporting and, and, and all the social... Uh, sustainability aspects with that. That's the, all these emerging topics is leading the industry's interest right now. PFAS, uh, emerging contaminants is huge right now as far as a, a new contaminant of concern that's in the industry as it relates to drinking water and remediation technologies and things like that. Uh, you know, we're, we're getting into digital innovation to help, you know, transform the way you do your business. Uh, these are all the types of topics and I'm sure I'm missing a few that, you know, you know, greenhouse gas, probably, I'm probably mentioned that one too, but you know, those are the things that seems to be really driving the interest in our industry right now. And if I was to use foresight into this area of the environmental business, what would be the way uh, we, you know, a company would go about planning for their trajectory of how to, uh, you know, assist a company or to, you know, prepare for you know, meeting these 2035 goals that some of these companies are setting up in sustainability. Yeah, it's, I mean, you put your finger on one of the, what I consider to be one of the major trends that are uh, influencing the, the, the course of, of work, society and economies. Um, and for the next several years, this whole ESG movement and, and, and intertwined or as a direct part of that, I would, I would point to action on climate change uh, we're yeah. taping, oh, yeah. taping this interview two days before a summit of leaders from 40 countries that has the potential to reinvigorate uh, talks and action among governments on climate change um, and and may yield some some major announcements that could show that we're on a uh, on a new new trajectory. Um, I mean, this is for companies that are not necessarily well. So many are attuned to what's happening in ESG. You'd have to be kind of out to lunch not to be. Yeah, right now, right. Yeah. But, but um, they may be having a difficult time, you know, figuring out how to address it as a company, right? Then they know they need to, but how do I start to get there? Because they really haven't done a lot of that in the past. Yeah. They've just done the compliance side of things. You know, they've complied with EPA regulations or state regulations, but they haven't really thought about how do I, in you know, uh, develop a whole system in our operating business to achieve this in a more efficient way. Yeah. Well, some of these, some of these companies uh, sound ripe for <laughs> the application of strategic foresight. Um, looking at, for example, in 2035, which as you've mentioned is a, a target date for a lot of companies in terms of commitments or, or aspirations that they have. Um, 
and, and look at where, where is our industry going to be at or you know, tailor a question. And that's something else about foresight. It's best approached with a particular question in mind. Like what kind of, in the case of South Africa, what kind of a, you know, what kind of a, a government and society we want in, in, in 10 years hence, same sort of thing uh, in this space. Um, and by going through an exercise where you're drawing upon um, outside your usual circle to methodically and in a structured fashion, draw on, on inputs from many others, not just in the environmental field, because there's going to be, that's the thing is you got to kind of expand one's uh, horizons um, to, to see what else may be happening in society that could be affecting um, uh, the space you're most interested in. And I would, for example, um, the finance sector, um, corporate governance and the role of, of, of uh, shareholders. Uh, what is the trend in terms of government um, regulation? There are a number of things. Um, Bitcoin, okay? Um, Bitcoin is being found to have um, a, a big impact on the environment because of the energy required uh, to generate Bitcoin. Uh, and if this continues to... Really? I haven't yes. thought about it. I mean, it thought it was all digital. It's, it's in the cloud. Well, yeah, it's, it, it seems like <laughs> a good idea until you look at what, what it takes in terms of the energy commitment. And much of that energy or the electricity, is, its power is, is drawn from non-clean sources, right? And non-renewable. So anyway, what I'm getting at is a foresight study could help to open the eyes of decision makers, uh, mm -hmm. companies, uh, beyond what they do day to day uh, by seeing how different um, different spheres in society and industry and trends, not just environmental trends, could interact um, to uh, affect how they're doing business. Um, yeah. well, well, so I'm interested too, because I mean, the, the environmental aspect of foresight, I think has a big play. I mean, another one I mentioned that, or one another topic that's really driving the industry is circular economy you know, and what does that mean? And how can we reduce our waste streams and, and, and develop a, a, an ass essentially an ecosystem within our operating, you know, day-to-day -day life that takes the waste out of the system? I mean, that is, seems like a foresight project that's ripe for that type of work. Well, the, the, the great thing about a lot of environmentally friendly moves is that they, they also make sense from a a cost financial perspective, too, right? right. Um, you know, if you put in more efficient lighting in your building, right? Uh, if you're using the right kind of light bulbs, um, I mean, this is a minor example, but and you pay attention to um, the building's uh, efficiency and and uh, you know, you adopt high stand lead and other standards. It may cost more now, but it's going to save you money over time. So uh, what I'm getting at is a number of pro-environmental moves are good for business and aspects of the circular economy, including reusing waste, uh, can fit into that. Not to say that there, in other uh, areas, uh, some costs and trade-offs are going to be necessary, but there are these low-hanging fruits. Sure, sure. So has there been anything uh, with, you know, foresight has been used recently? I mean... Say, for instance, I mean, how has the COVID-19 crisis influenced the whole use of foresight? Because that seems to be, we, sh we should have seen this one coming or something, right? I mean, tell, tell us what your thoughts are on this whole COVID crisis, because we're all living it right now, and it's really had a, a major effect in society. Yeah, and, and we're hoping that 2021 brings, uh, brings an end to the worst aspects of it in terms of continued spread of the virus and such, although we'll be living with the consequences for many years to come. Um, let me take this opportunity to come back to a question we discussed earlier, the relationship between forecasting and foresight. Uh, so there were a lot of forecasts done in 2018 and 2019 for, say, 2020 and 2021. So organizations, businesses, and, and uh, others were planning ahead, and they were using traditional forecasting for the next year or two. And by the time April of 2020 arrived, they were shredding their forecasts, which uh, were of little use then. Um, if you look back um, to 2010, um, there was um, a study done by the Rockefeller Foundation. It was uh, using scenarios, which again are a big part of strategic foresight. They were looking at scenarios for the future 
of technology and international development. So in 2010, these scenarios, one of them, of these handful of scenarios, looked uh, included very prominently a global pandemic that was spread from uh, animals that uh, killed millions, that resulted in closure of borders, that saw China come out in a better place earlier than many other countries, and that's what we see today, um, that there would be greater government surveillance and intervention, um, and uh, eventually people would become tired of, of this greater surveillance and government control. Uh, and this is eerie. That was 10, you know, 11 years ago. Um, and that wasn't every scenario they painted, but that was one of a handful. Um, so it was all there before us. Um, so I think yeah, somebody, somebody did the work to kind of anticipate this being a real life scenario that could play out and they brought it up and, and wrote about it. Sure. I mean, and there, and there were plenty of other there were epidemiologists using different techniques and ep a lot of people were, were sending up the, 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 the warning signs. So what can we do? I mean, what, what's been happening in, in terms of foresight during COVID? Well, one thing it's done, and this shouldn't be a surprise, is we've all been kind of shaken and disrupted in our lives. Some profoundly, others we're, we're getting by and there's, it's mostly inconvenience depending on you know where you, where you are and what you're doing. Uh, but it's caused organizations, again, in the private and public sectors to really focus on, look, we need to be better prepared um, and for what's, what's coming next. And COVID and all that it has brought um, in terms of uncertainty and volatility came on top of existing massive influential trends like urbanization, like aging, like the growing role of Asia on the planet. Uh, we could go on and on, the threats to the environment, the number of major trends and technological trends like automation. And so you throw on top of all these things that were already happening and influencing the, our futures, you threw in a, a pandemic which shook everything up and also accelerated certain trends like toward automation. Um, I mean, we're, we're holding this, this discussion uh, over a, a platform from distance as opposed to being in the same studio. And we've kind of taken for granted that uh, a lot of our interactions uh, are, are now taken uh, from, from distance uh, over yeah. a screen. Um, so in, in short, uh, a, a lot more organizations are expressing an interest uh, in foresight. Um, you've had a slew of studies produced by different uh, organizations, uh, some of them shorter term foresight studies. Uh, as we've discussed, foresight tends to look 10 years beyond, but because there's so much curiosity uh, and anxiousness about well, what's going to come like right after COVID, uh, some of these are, are kind of abbreviated or shorter term foresight studies looking at just the next handful of years, trying to see, you know, fashion some sense out of uh, this uncertainty and volatility uh, and, and, and complexity uh, to figure out what's going to happen next. Um, just uh, internationally, you've seen um, the government of Greece has created a unit um, in the president's office to do foresight. Um, in the U.S. government, a number of agencies have already been using foresight to varying degrees. Uh, the U.S. International Development Agency, U.S. Aid, just created a strategic foresight unit. And, and you're seeing these kinds of developments. Um, universities, um, particularly the University of Houston, uh, is offering a degree. Um, in, in strategic foresight, a master's degree, and they do consulting work, and, and they have their, their hands full with, with queries and demand for their services. So as you see, there's a lot more interest in foresight and how that can help companies be better prepared, not only for risks, Sean, but also what, where might there be opportunities? Yeah, right. Like how can we capitalize on opportunities? Um, you know, just I, you know, just thinking like in the environmental space, how can I, you know, I'm forecasting all these trends that are going on in the industry we just talked about. How could a company forecast how to prepare themselves to, you know, help, help clients trying to achieve those outcomes and, and prepare ourselves and position ourselves to, you know, take advantage of those opportunities. So I, I think there was, that'd be important. I, I guess, I guess some of the challenges that I see, and maybe I'm wrong, but, you know, tell me what you think. People who know how to do the foresight exercise, I mean, really like organize the, the group. I mean, there's got to be a, a ringleader, so to speak, in a, in a way, right? That's really trained and knows how to do this because I, I got to imagine it, it, there's obviously some skill to this whole process. So how, how does that work? And, 
I mean, you talked about colleges giving, you know, master's degrees in it. I mean, it seems like you'd be a lot of training involved with this for someone who has this ability. Yeah, it's a good point. And you can, it, you can invest a little or a lot in strategic foresight, but the good news is you don't need to have somebody on your team that has a master's degree in foresight to begin applying it. Mm -hmm. There are, I mean, as you're getting into a yes, tapping some external expertise in the way of a consultant or what have you makes sense. Um, but you can, you can build up internal capacity fairly quickly. And that points to one of the reasons why I wrote this book is because there's, there's a lack of understanding about the need for foresight and the way that it can really benefit organizations. And there's also a lack of, uh, available tools and guides on how to use it. And the wonderful thing is that there are a number of places, if you know where to look, where you can get access to, to free quality uh, guides, including the exercises to follow and, and concrete examples. And that has increased during the pandemic times. I wouldn't suggest an organization try and do it all on its own at the outset, but right. in terms of, of getting some idea of what it's all about, not only my book, but in particular, some of the references to uh, established, whether it's a consultancy or uh, I pointed to the government of Canada, which which provides uh, uh, a whole suite of, of, of exercises on, on how to apply foresight. So it's more accessible uh, than, than ever before. Um, and, you know, I'm sometimes asked, what would be my advice to an organization that's tiptoeing in this direction, you know, and, and they're not prepared at the outset to put a you know, few hundred thousand dollars or more uh, in, into, into foresight and thinking about the future. I would I, I come back to horizon scanning, make this a regular part of your work. And this can apply in our individual lives as well. Start looking out for um, weak signals. This is and this, this is one reason why foresight isn't embraced more by leaders because of the jargon, right? When I'm talking about the weak signals, these are um, indications of, of something. And we don't know how serious uh, right. they are. So it can be a weak signal might end up being a, a wild card, which is a, a low probability but high impact uh, event. Um, or it could be the beginnings of a major trend. Um, if, we, if we look around us um, from different domains, uh, you see um, the Russian government uh, building up its bases uh, in the far north uh, facing the Arctic. Is that... Uh, is that a wild card? Is that a trend? Is that something that could give rise to and have in, uh, interact with other uh, implications? Uh, we've seen a slew of new apps, some of which may come or go uh, or be not, you know, knocked out on the market by arrival. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Clubhouse. Uh, uh, no, it's it's right. a new social app. You're going to check when you get when you get off this interview. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's an audio app that basically brings people together. Uh, with, without video, and it's like meeting in a room, but being COVID times, we don't do that. And it's uh, it's it's beginning to mushroom. Um, and it's something that might get caught at an early stage uh, for those who are rolling out new apps and, and, and looking for competition. Something like a clubhouse could, could be of influence. Another one I'll cite for you is ghost kitchens. Okay. Ghost kitchens are basically, um, they're like industrial kitchens that that are putting together the meals that are, are branded. So a lot of restaurants had to go on a hiatus so they were only doing takeout, right? In yeah. the US and elsewhere. Um, it became, if you're, if you're not inviting people into your restaurant, does it matter where you make the food? Um, so they found economies of scale and you have these big, these big kitchens that are producing for different um, clients, restaurants. Yeah. different restaurants and for different brands. Uh, and, and new brands are being invented, and you have no idea that they may be coming. You know, maybe produced in a section of this, uh, basically a factory, yeah, <laughs> or to another product that you associate with some other restaurant or brand. And ghost kitchens may be sticking around because of economies of scale, even when we're relatively through this crisis. These are examples of I'm trying to get at. These are the kinds of things you can capture with uh, horizon scanning, which, depending on your field of of, of activity could become quite relevant in the future. And it's only by continually monitoring them do they disappear or do they become something bigger like uh, the growing power of those Middle Eastern oil producers in the early 1970s, something that Shell saw as a possibility and indeed emerged and, and upset uh, the world economy. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, okay. As we get ready to kind of, we're getting down to the end here. Um, and uh, I really, I really thought that the the book was was really well written and helped me understand the whole concept of foresight. Um, and I guess a couple questions: what What would you? What's your hope uh, for the listeners or the readers of your book to walk away from? You know, uh, what message are you hoping that they take away from the book itself? That's one, and then. The other one, it would be like, well, what, what are like, say, three things that you would recommend a firm operating in the environmental industry and it's interested in applying foresight? What, how do they get started? On that first question, I would say think more about the future and explore alternative futures and what may come next and incorporate the learnings from that into your strategies and plans. This can only benefit you. Again, identifying opportunities as well as being better prepared for risks. So that would be the first thing. In terms of three specific recommendations, one would be for organizations um, that um, do not do a great job of learning from their experience, documenting and sharing it, uh, have silos within the organization, become a learning organization. Make sure that you're drawing fully on the assets that are in the, the minds of your staff and mm -hmm. the experience of the projects that you've led become a learning organization. Secondly, I keep talking about horizon scanning and I've cited some examples here. Yep. You can start doing horizon scanning for, for weak signals. And this is a low cost. This is a, a minor investment that could yield uh, great benefits uh, and is the basis of any major foresight study that you might do at a future time. So start with the, the scanning. Sure. Uh, yep. And the third thing is uh, a lot of times foresight is, is used simply to test basic assumptions, uh, often implicit uh, in your organization's plans and strategies. So when, when organizations uh, point to their, their plan or strategy for next year, for the next five, 10 years, how often do they revisit the underlying assumptions, which circumstances around us may be undermining? So revisit your base assumptions regularly Gotcha. That your plans and strategies are future fit, if you will. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I highly recommend the book. Uh, Bart, if you want to show that book again real quick to the to the listeners and the viewers here, um, I'm going to raffle off a book for the listeners. So um, pay attention and uh, look on social media later this uh, next week as I try to get a, a you know, a a listener to, uh, you know, sign up and, and I'm going to raffle that off. So Bart, thanks for joining today. I really learned a lot about, uh, foresight, the planning process, uh, the, the application of it. Um, you know, what's the value of it? I think there's so much here and just spending time thinking about the future in quiet time. I mean, we're so busy as people. I mean, we're so distracted from social media to, you know, always on a device or something. I, I think you need to carve out that quiet time to just kind of think, right. To really do this justice. I'd say that's yeah. fair. If we can all, <laughs> it's always finding that bit of time. And, and that explains in part why foresight hasn't been used more, more often than it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Hey, this has been great, Bart. Thanks for coming on the show and we'll look forward to getting this out next week. And uh, it's going to be, uh, I think, well-received and then make sure you can, circulate amongst your uh, social networks as well. So thanks for coming on. Sean, it was a real pleasure. Really enjoyed talking to you and I look forward to future editions of the podcast. Absolutely. I hope you, hope you will too. That's great. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.